Well, you've had plenty of time to look at that. I was wondering earlier on if I'd made my deliberate mistake by leaving the words to vote out, and I was wondering what that kind of amendment would have meant. Thank you so much for coming, because to me this is a very, very important subject. Thank you so much to the Clinton School of Public Service for asking me to come here to talk about this subject. And thank you also to all those members of the Butler Centre, of the Central Library, and of the History Commission who have helped me with getting slides and other, other artefacts for putting into this, um, this uh, show. The 19th Amendment is a monumental feat in American history and politics, but you'd hardly guess that by looking at the history books, because so often what happens is that historians mention in a cursory way, women were given the vote and then move on to everything else, business as usual. And 92 years after its ratification, unfortunately, the 19th Amendment tends to be ignored. And also, unfortunately, I've come across people who think that women always had the vote, and they certainly didn't. The history of the 19th Amendment is not just the story of ratification in 1919 and 1920. That was just the final saga. Its history went back 72 years to Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the Seneca Falls Convention where Elizabeth fought to get a voting rights resolution introduced in the resolutions that they were doing that year, and she won it only with the support of Frederick Douglass. Women's suffrage from then on evolved over time into a cause with deep local roots and a campaign also for a national amendment. And there are 48 separate stories in all about the 19th Amendment, plus the national story of women's suffrage. And so today what I'm going to do is look at how the Arkansas story is linked with the national story. The history of equal suffrage in Arkansas goes back to 1868, when Miles Langley of Arkadelphia proposed rights for women in the new constitution of that year. In the succeeding years, there were several instances where women's suffrage came up in Little Rock, but it was only in 1888 that the momentum picked up. This is when Clara McDermott emerged on the scene here in the city and helped found the Arkansas Equal Suffrage Association. Clara's house still stands at 1424 Center Street. It's probably the house in which she wrote this letter to the Boston Women's Journal to tell of the founding of the Arkansas Equal Suffrage Association. And that's the only record that I've been able to find of the founding of that organization. It's interesting, there's nothing on the house to mark that this was Clara's house. It's, it does mark that it's a, a, an important 19th century house of the Quapaw Quarter, but it doesn't link it with suffrage, unfortunately. Langley's proposal for voting rights for women was laughed out of the debate in the old state house. And a sad Langley wrote to Susan B. Anthony that he had failed. This is the first link between Arkansas's history of suffrage and the national movement. When Langley's motion for women's suffrage was introduced, the house became so clamorous that the president could not restore order and the meeting adjourned. Later, his speech was met with ridicule and sarcasm. This defeat of women's suffrage in 1868 was unfortunately a huge failure in Arkansas history because if Arkansas had given women the vote that, day, that, that year, Arkansas would have been the first state in the union to do so. So that's how, um, that's the first link between the national and Arkansas and the second connection between Arkansas and the national suffrage movement was, was when Clara and the Arkansas Equal Suffrage Association brought Antony, in, brought Antony to Little Rock in 1889. Antony spoke, spoke twice in Little Rock, once on suffrage at the, at the Capitol Theatre on Markham and once on temperance at the Grand Opera House on Maine. And as you can see from the advert, it was her first visit to the South. This advert came from a local woman's journal, which was published for about 
five years, around about that time. Clara died in 1899, and the next year, 1900, Carrie Chapman Catt, who had then recently been elected Antony's successor in the National American Women's Suffrage Association, Catt spoke in the YMCA at Eighth and Main. She also held an informal reception at the Capitol Hotel, and Catt was president of the NASA until 1904. After that visit in 1900, there's a dearth of history about the suffrage movement in Arkansas for a decade. In January of 1911, when the NASA had been working for state suffrage for 21 years, a woman's suffrage bill was introduced in the Arkansas legislature, and the measure may have been triggered by Washington State's woman's suffrage victory in November 1910. Washington was the fifth equal suffrage state, and the win ended a 14-year hiatus in victories in the campaign for state equal suffrage. At this time, Little Rock women began to stir, and in late February 1911, some of them founded the Arkansas Political Equality League. They did it up in a house of 1422 Rock Street. The house is no longer there. Over time, this group allied with the NASA, the largest suffrage association in the nation with roots going back to 1848 and the Seneca Falls Convention. The 1911 women's suffrage bill failed to pass, as did one in 1913. The 1915 suffrage amendment passed. This story refers to it but didn't make it to the ballot because only three amendments were allowed to go to the voters. It seems that the circumstances quite suited the legislature, legislators because one of them brought his fiddle and they had a grand party in the chamber. They were quite delighted that it hadn't, it hadn't made it to the ballot, it seems. So you can see there was still opposition to women's suffrage in Arkansas, but this time the women didn't back down. There was frequent suffrage activity in Little Rock in the next few years. And this uh, is an example of the kind of things that they did to get publicity. They, had, they won that first prize. It was the Pulaski County Fair Parade. And uh, it was with a decorated uh, automobile. And remember, automobiles weren't all that. They were fairly new at that time. Not everybody had them. Uh, they had suffrage schools. They did these regularly. They used to do them in the old library, which was up at 7th and... Um, 7th and, Louis, and, and Louisiana, and um, this is where they taught women how to, how to be responsible citizens. Today is suffrage day, cakes for the ball players. Well, that, that's what they did for three years in a row to, to highlight suffrage going up to the ballpark. And I can't remember what the name of the, 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 uh, the players were, but I think they were one of these big ones that they had in the state at the time. But I'm not a sports person, so don't include me for that. <laughs> Late in 1915, Carrie Chapman Catt became president of the NASA once more. And she moved the organization beyond campaigning just for state suffrage amendments and encouraged workers to go for whatever suffrage they could get, including national suffrage. And Catt came to Little Rock on a national tour promoting this. This photograph was taken either outside that door, in here, or outside the other door. They arrived at this station here. On the, on the left is Carrie Chapman Catt. Then it's Mrs. T.T. T. Cottenham. Then Mrs. Minnie Trumbull and Mrs. O.F. Ellington. Mrs. Catt and Mrs. Trumbull, the newspaper reported, were met at Rock Island Station by a large number of suffrage supporters. 18 automobiles decorated with suffrage emblems paraded the streets for a half hour after the distinguished workers' arrival. Many out-of-town suffragists came to hear the addresses. The other two women, Mrs. Cottenham and Mrs. Ellington, were leaders of the Arkansas suffrage movement with many lieutenants such as Josephine Miller on the left and Gertrude Watkins, who helped organize Arkansas 
into local branches after Kat's visit in 1916. These four women tied Arkansas closely to national suffrage politics. In 1915, Mrs. Cottenham, Mrs. Ellington, and Gertrude Watkins helped in the unsuccessful New York State suffrage campaign. They actually it says they were going to be street orators, and that's what suffragists did. It was a pretty revolutionary thing for women to do, which had been started in Britain about 10, 15 years before. Women would go and stand in street corners and start talking suffrage. This was 1917, and Mrs. Cottenham and Gertrude Watkins were again in New York for the New York suffrage campaign again. This time they had Josephine Miller with them, and this was a successful campaign. And the New York victory was pivotal in helping promote the federal amendment. And the Arkansas women received many accolades from the New York suffragists for the work that they had done in that campaign. That same year, 1917, Arkansas women at home also carried out the NASA's new policy successfully. That was the year that the state granted them the right to vote in primaries. This is the news report of the governor signing that measure. And it, it happened in the old Marion Hotel, which is now where the Peabody is, which may not long be Peabody very much longer if the name hasn't already gone. And, um, The, the, between the signing, uh, sorry, um, yeah, between the signing and a suffrage school which had been held to celebrate this measure and to um, prepare women for the right to vote, there was another parade through the streets, and Josephine Miller once again was important in organising that. Now I've got to move on at this point to separate events linked to Arkansas women's primary suffrage triumph that fulfilled NASA's policy of 1916. That new policy that Kat had introduced when she came here was in direct response to the resurgent federal amendment campaign, which was the work of the National Women's Party, whose driving forces were young women with a brand new organization using revolutionary tactics, and they were determined to win. Alice Paul on the left, and Lucy Burns, well, they're, they're really special to me. They emerged from the militant Women's Social and Political Union in Britain. They were two of the first three suffragettes ever imprisoned in Scotland. They went on hunger strike in Dundee Prison in 1909 and on their release, and they were released because the authorities were terrified what, what would happen to them. They didn't want to end up with dead bodies on their hands. They were welcomed by a huge crowd and they had a, um, f were fêted by a banquet. Paul and Burns learned about suffrage parades by working on the huge Scottish suffrage parade in October of 1909. And Burns remained in Scotland for another two years. In November 1909, Paul was imprisoned in England and went on hunger strike and she was force fed. She returned to the US in January of 1920. And when these two young women, Alice Paul was 26 and Lucy Burns was 30, 32, that when they began working in Washington, D.C., they brought many of the methods they'd learned in Britain to the campaign here. This is a 1908 poster of the Women's Freedom League in Britain. And note that word, demands. The Women's Freedom League demands women had decided they were no longer going to beg and plead for the vote. They were asserting themselves and they were going to demand it because they believed it was their right. Exactly the same terminology appears in the great suffrage parade that Paul and Burns organized for the day before President Wilson's inauguration in order to get maximum publicity for the cause. This was on March the 3rd, 1913, a hundred years ago, next March the 3rd. And the word, it's really interesting, I haven't come across any other photographs of this. This was a huge big banner they took round that, that, down on that parade from the Capitol to the White House. 
But I, th this is the only photograph I've seen of it. I don't know if there's any other record. It's a, and it's a pity because it was such a, an important assertion, that, a statement that women were no longer going to lie down and accept the fact that they were not going to have the vote. This is another example of what militant suffragettes did. And this was in Britain. They used contemporary references to highlight the hypocrisies of their own governments. Here British women equated Prime Minister Asquith with the Tsar of Russia just a month after an unpopular visit by the Tsar to Britain. And of course, the Tsar was an oppressive ruler. In 1917, a member of the National Women's Party displays a banner with a similar theme. And this is pretty um, inflammatory because at the time, the US is at war with Germany, but they're calling the president Kaiser Wilhelm. And this banner, needless to say, caused a riot, but it wasn't the women. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and Burns imported other methods from Britain. They began with the giant suffrage parade in Washington, DC, which I've just mentioned. Later, they opposed the party in power, then the Democrats, and they brought, this is what happened in Britain. If, if you didn't like what was going on, you opposed the party in power, but this wasn't what happened in the US, not, not up to this time anyway. And so they, they were opposing the Democrats as long as Congress failed to act for women's suffrage. And then in a completely new departure, they demanded President Wilson's support for suffrage and picketed the White House when he did nothing which he resolutely did. He had no intention of helping to get women's suffrage. They continued their demands even when war was declared in 1917, and they ended up in prison. They were beaten, went on hunger strike, and were tortured, but they stood their ground. And if you want to get a quick insight into what the National Women's Party did, get hold of, nation, of Iron Jawed Angels. They've got it in the library at last. And um, it will shock you, and it will also make you cry. The National, the National Women's Party was like the NASA, a national organization, and Ar Arkansas also had links to it. When Paul visited here at Little Rock in January 1916 to establish a branch of the National Women's Party in Arkansas, the meeting took place at the Marion Hotel, and Paul achieved quite a coup she established a group in the state, and one of the capital's leading society matrons, Adolphine Fletcher Terry, agreed to be on the NWP's National Advisory Council. At that time, suffrage societies garnered themselves credibility by having key members of society lend their name to the cause. And Terry who became much, much more famous in 1957 with the desegregation crisis. Terry had a personal link with the NWP. She went to Vassar a couple of years behind Lucy Burns, and she credited Burns in her biography with opening her eyes to racism. So Terry, and Terry's role, along with the support of other women who took up local positions in Paul's organization, demonstrates that some Arkansas women did not support NASA's traditional, passive, deferential approach to women winning state suffrage. And Arkansas also made an appearance at the national level. The National Women's Party rolled out its first pickets in January 1917 in response to President Wilson's continued refusal to give his support to women's suffrage. The woman on the extreme right is Miss Pauline Floyd of El Dorado, Arkansas. And unfortunately, I don't have any more information about her, but this is one record that shows that Arkansas was involved with militant suffragism when the NWP began to up the ante seriously. Interestingly, last night I found another photograph of Pauline Floyd, and it was dated 1915, so she had been with them for a long time. That's a story I think that's, that's worthwhile looking into. And if anybody's related to her, please let me know. <laughs> now, I want to compare these two organizations because NASA and the NWP didn't get along. 
NASA didn't care for the NWP's militancy. It objected to the NWP's pickets. It was appalled at the refusal of the NWP to suspend the cause for the duration of the war and accused NWP members of being unpatriotic. But there was more, and I think this was even more important. Paul and Burns were young upstarts, and unfortunately, young upstarts weren't welcomed by the NASA, especially when they began to steal the, old, or the older ladies and the older organizations' thunder. And the, th the rift didn't spill out publicly, mainly because Paul kept quiet. She just kept her head on the, her, you know, kept her eye on the goal. But the NASA, interestingly enough, worked with the NWP in 1914, and it's seen in Arkansas. On May the 2nd, 1914, NASA suffragists in Little Rock held a rally at the old state capitol and then walked across the road in a, a parade to the old capitol hotel for a celebration luncheon afterwards. And among the 24 speakers who gave five-minute talks that day were Mrs. T.T. T. Cottenham and Josephine Miller. But this rally was actually part of a national event that Alice Paul and the NWP called for. It wasn't a NASA event. And this was called because the suffrage amendment, the federal suffrage amendment, had just been defe defeated in Congress. Nationally and locally, this was the last time that NASA people worked with the NWP. In 1916, when Alice Paul visited, although local, local NASA members attended her meeting, they steadfastly kept their distance and refused their support. The disagreement of NASA and the NWP became very public in 1917, not only nationally but also in Little Rock. The NWP had picketed the president since January the 10th. The NASA castigated the NWP's unpatriotic behavior in annoying the president during a war, and they were shocked that NWP members demeaned women by getting imprisoned and worse, going on hunger strike. In November 1917, Alice Paul's arrest, hunger strike and force feeding had become a huge national controversy with many against the NWP. NWP emissaries began to tour the country to explain the actions, why they were, going, why they were picketing, why they were going to prison, why they were doing hunger strikes. Former suffrage prisoner Mabel Vernon headed to Little Rock but this visit was not welcomed by local members of the NASA. Before Vernon arrived, the local suffrage representative said, the Arkansas Women's Suffrage League will certainly make Miss Vernon realize when she arrives in Little Rock that the only welcome which awaits here is a Jack Frost welcome. Local women more than cold shouldered the NWP, they rallied the local troops to ostracize them the NWP reported initially everything was going smoothly on these tours. They had large, sympathetic, and outraged audiences wherever they went, and then suddenly it stopped. Then the NWP history reported, and this answered a question I had, but she was initially advertised to talk in City Hall, that this was the result of concerted action on the part of authorities was evident from the fact that within a few days, four speakers in different parts of the country were blocked. In Arkansas, they recalled Mabel Vernon's permit for the court. The courthouse, it says here, it was the city hall. That's what was advertised in the newspapers. But Vernon had her meeting anyway in a place called, no longer existing, the Royal Arcanum Hall. And she had an attendance of about 50. And they sent a resolution by telegram to President Wilson. She also held a street meeting at 4th and Main and even displayed one of the banners that Pickett's had used in the White House. They managed to bring the battle that was going on in Washington, D.C. as close to home as they could, and they did, it, did this all over the country. But the, while the campaign for suffrage seemed interminable, eventually the long-fought amendment passed and on July the 28th, 1919, Arkansas became the 12th state to ratify during a special session of the legislature. And these are the headlines the day after ratification. 
and the commemorative photograph with the governor and the women who had organized the special session was taken on the steps of the Capitol. These women even offered to pay the expenses of the representatives to come to the special session so that they could get the amendment ratified. Tennessee guaranteed ratification with, one, with a one vote margin on August the 20th, 1920, and the 19th Amendment was promulgated on August the 26th, 1920. Now, votes for women seems a very straightforward notion, but there were several misconceptions about what the 19th Amendment did. And this is when I got on my high horse. One misconception was that it gave women complete equality under the law. And the story here on the left is of a woman in Kansas arrested for disorderly behavior because she was chewing tobacco. <laughs> women weren't allowed to do it, but men could do it. Uh, but the judge let her off because women now had the vote, but the vote was nothing to do with criminal behavior. <laughs> the other story on the right here is from Texas where a husband argues in court that women would have no, should have no special protections against desertion or cruel treatment because they now had the vote. And this is nothing, nothing to do with family law. It was the vote. And so the stories reveal that many thought that equality under the law came along with women winning the vote, but it didn't. It's quite clear in Arkansas Women, women couldn't run for office even though they had the vote, and they couldn't be notaries even though they had the vote. And these stories appeared in the run-up to the election in 1920, but, you know, there was an awful lot more. There were actually many other equalities, particularly under marital law. And um, also, the, um, women in the workplace, they were very discriminated against in their pay. An awful lot of this was tackled in the 1970s, bit by bit when the women movement revived at that time. There were exceptions to voting rights of women. Another misconception was that all women got the vote, all women got the vote under the 19th Amendment, but barred from voting, according to the Census Bureau, were about 60,000 Indian women, most of whom were living on reservations, 8,607 Chinese and Japanese women in, il, ineligible to vote, and a comparatively small number, not to them of course, of American women married to aliens. If you married a foreigner, you lost your citizenship. That's what happened in those days. Also deprived, all, also barred, <laughs> also barred were women deprived of the ballot under state statutes in harmony with constitutional provisions. Duh. I don't know how they can get away with this stuff. <laughs> anyway, um, one of these state statutes in harmony with constitutional provisions was the poll tax. Now the tax could trip up your voting prospects even if you had the money. The first story here on the left, quoting yet another local suffragist Lula Scruggs of North Little Rock is from 1970 when an incorrect receipt could prevent a woman voting in primary suffrage, which they had just been given that year. And the other story was from 1920. There was a great debate after ratification of the national amendment whether women would have to pay a poll tax to vote because the, the, rat the amendment had been ratified so late in the year. It was ratified in late August. This story confirmed that they had to pay their poll tax if they want to vote, but it was published two days before the election. So that kind of uncertainty must have had an impact on the women's vote in Arkansas at that time. And in fact, it's more complicated than what I'm saying here. Now, the poll tax tr is traditionally considered, along with literacy tests, the key measure designed to keep black voters from the polls. But poll taxes also cut out many poor whites from voting, and they would hit women disproportionately because their wages were about 50% of men's. 
And to give you an indication of how oppressive the poll tax was, in Arkansas in 1929, this is a year I've got the, the information for, it was, the poll tax was $1 annually, which doesn't sound a lot to us, but the average annual per capita income was $310. So that was quite an oppressive, um, oppressive tax. So in spite of these limitations, the 19th Amendment was a monumental achievement, despite the fact that that's a scootery wee piece of paper over there in the library, which, you know, you go in there with all these great expectations and it's just a legal size, uh, onion skin type of paper. It's still got vibes, it made me shake when I saw it, but um, it was a monumental achievement. After 72 years of campaigning, <coughs> for a right that should have been women's in the first place if the nation's founding documents had lived up to their rhetoric, and they did not. Now, the amendment was monumental, firstly, because of how it was achieved. The 19th Amendment, let me point out, and I'm definitely on my high horse here, was not a grant. Women won the vote. They had fought it for 72 years. The campaign is remarkable in US history for being grassroots. It also won what it wanted, namely the vote, without even having the tool that was usually needed for political victory, namely the vote, and largely without the support of the people in power, the male half of the population. Carrie Chapman Catt made this quite clear when she wrote The History of Women's Suffrage. This is a summary by cat of 52 years of campaigning. It includes 910 campaigns over the 52 years after the 14th Amendment of 1868. And this record from those 52 years does not include the 20 years from 1848 in which women worked to secure equal rights for themselves, nor the nationwide campaigns of the National Women's Party. Another reason the 19th Amendment was monumental was the size of the increase in the potential electorate. 26,500,000 women were potential beneficiaries of the 19th Amendment according to the Census Bureau. And the number of potential male voters at that time was 31,500,000. And a third reason that the 19th Amendment was monumental is for the potential that it offered. It was the gateway to more reforms. It wasn't the be-all and end-all. This, be this was just the first step. And Alice Paul said about it, we have won a great victory, but there are many victories over sex discrimination yet to be won. But with the vote as a tool, women can accomplish anything. Paul and the National Women's Party introduced the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923 in an attempt to get blanket, blanket equality for women under the law. But 89 years after its first introduction, the Equal Rights Amendment still lacks three state ratifications, and Arkansas is one of those 15 unratified states. And this is a stark contrast to how speedily Arkansas acted when the 19th Amendment was um, was sent to the states for ratification when it was 12th. The right to vote is the only one of the resolutions made at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 that has made it into the US Constitution. All the other reforms that women wanted related to, to equality under the law, and today there is still no equality under the law on account of sex in the National Constitution and a federal era would ultimately inform decisions both nationally and in every state if we had it ratified. But in spite of this failure, women have made incredible strides in almost every sphere since the passage of women's suffrage. Because it gave women the political power, the 19th Amendment, it's almost the gift that keeps on giving, except that it was never given in the first place. It was worked hard for and workers had to overcome tremendous odds. The 19th Amendment is also significant for helping the emergence of black Americans in US politics in the 20th century. To understand this, we have to look back to the time of Reconstruction, which is famous for freeing the slaves 
protecting their rights and giving black men the vote. It should also be famous for cutting women out of the new democracy of that time, but that is less well known, unfortunately. Women had expected to be included in the expansion of the vote during Reconstruction. After all, at the start of the Civil War, they gave up campaigning for their own rights and contributed heavily to war work. They felt they had earned the vote. In addition, many women, including Susan B. Anthony, campaigned after the Emancipation Proclamation for a complete end to slavery. And when the war ended, they advocated equal suffrage for all. But in those heady and tumultuous days when rights of freedmen were discussed and advocated everywhere, women of all races were ignored. And despite vigorous campaigning, women failed to get themselves included in the 14th and 15th Amendments, and they also found the word male entered into the Constitution for the first time. In the wake of these defeats, they devised a new strategy of direct action, latching their action onto key words in the 14th Amendment. The key words I've outlined in red, persons born or naturalized are citizens, and no state shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens. Women at this point became creative and pushy. No more begging, no more please, sir. Unfortunately, they lost that later on, and it had to be regained after around about 1912. They began to challenge the voting laws on the grounds that under the 14th Amendment, women were already citizens and therefore already had a right to the privileges and immunities of citizens, including the vote. Here, Susan B. Anthony is pilloried for the temerity to think that she, a mere woman, had the right to vote. She wasn't the only one to vote after 1868. Those women who did found in court that their ingenious argument that they had a right to vote under the 14th Amendment failed. The D District of Columbia Supreme Court declared the legal vindication of the natural right of all citizens to vote would involve the destruction of civil government. Antony voted for President Grant in 1872 was arrested for breaking the law under a reconstruction statute entitled an act to enforce the right of citizens of the United States to vote. And she was refused trial by jury in 1873. And it became the most famous state trial in the late 19th century. This, she, many people contributed to her defense and she turned it into a book about the trial and sent it all over the country. She did not waste a single opportunity of getting publicity for women's right to vote. But she never achieved her plan to take her case to the Supreme Court. However, Virginia Minor did. In 1872, Minor was not allowed to register to vote. She sued, beginning her challenge under the 14th Amendment, in the very same court in St. Louis, where the Dred Scott decision was handed down in 1857. In, 1872, in 1874, when it reached the US Supreme Court, that body decided in Minor versus Happersett that even if women were citizens, that fact did not mean that voting rights applied to them, for voting rights were not a privilege of citizenship. At the time of her own case, Susan B. Anthony declared, if we once establish the false principle that United States citizenship does not carry with it the right to vote in every state in this union, there is no end to the petty freaks and cunning devices that will be resorted to to exclude one and another class of citizens from the right of suffrage. And Anthony was 100% right having already established through women a gigantic restriction on citizens' right to vote. It was relatively easy then to turn on a much smaller group. In 1875, a year after Minor's case, the US Supreme Court began to limit 
the restrictions of the 15th Amendment on discrimination against freedmen. This was a gigantic impetus to emerging Jim Crow laws. For once black men could be excluded from the vote by various means not relating to race, they could be excluded from anything. Now these events are usually forgotten in the histories, but they're important because these judicial decisions in the 1870s made the suffragists decide that the only way to win women's suffrage was through a constitutional amendment. Antony wrote that amendment and it had it introduced in Congress in 1878. When the Susan B. Antony Amendment was promulgated in 1920, one gigantic effect was to override the, judi the judicial decisions of the 1870s that prevented women voting. Banning discrimination in the right to vote on account of sex, the 19th Amendment applied to everyone in the nation and it had an immediate effect. African-American women had worked for suffrage too. Unlike many white women who were opposed to suffrage, they were perhaps even more eager for the movement, for this moment, such as these, these women registering in Kentucky. There are two black women here. They are being forced to register outside. But the other two stories indicate that black women where they could actually registered and it caused quite a stir. Um, this one, the, the Democrat leaders were really upset and they were trying to get white women to go out and vote because the African American women were rushing to, to register when they could, if they could, if they were allowed to. In Kentucky, South Carolina and Texas, women besieged the registrars to enroll and that was black women and throughout Georgia on election day where women were not allowed to vote because registration had closed before ratification African American women besieged the polls and tried to vote anyway. Opponents of women's suffrage especially in the south had feared black women voters. They felt they wouldn't be able to intimidate black women the way they could intimidate black men. Also through restrictive state legislation the party machines had kept a tight control on black male voters. Now with the women entering the fray, they faced a much larger group to control. And they were correct to be concerned. In Alabama, after ratification in 1920, women who were furious about discriminatory registration requirements and tests contacted the NAACP for help, saying they wanted to sue. In Norfolk, Virginia, two African, two African American women actually won a case against a city's registrar for unfair literacy tests. What these fragments tell us is extremely important, and that is after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, the racial dynamic had changed. Now, if you turn your mind to that day in 1920, August the 26th, when many historical events had happened, not just the promulgation of the 19th Amendment. That day also, a decades-long national debate, and one which affected half the population, was now cleared off the table. When women won the vote, it meant that they could consider new things, such as moving into the political system to promote the measures they wanted. But now that women's suffrage was no longer an issue, suddenly African Americans' voting concerns could take center stage. They had been harmed by state measure, measures as a result of judicial decisions against women in the 1870s. But the women's victory in voting laws signaled the time when there could be a rollback on that also. African American women in North Little Rock on election day in 1920 took this opportunity seriously. In the race for constable, the Arkansas Gazette reported that 50 black women and only one white woman voted in one polling station. Another aspect of the changed dynamic of racial oppression was that African Americans' right to vote in terms of numbers had just doubled. Now they had more potential clout, especially if, they, especially if they combined. And this is what African Americans in Arkansas immediately tried to do in 1920. 
That fall, J.H. Blount of Forest City was the first African-American to run for governor in Arkansas. And that's interesting in itself. But equally interesting was African-Americans' plans for black male and female voters to work together to try to win Blount's election. The Arkansas Gazette even said that in, with the right conditions, the combined group, men and women, black men and women, might possibly beat the Democrats. And this could not have happened just over a month before that. This immediate pushback by African Americans in the wake of the 19th Amendment, as we all know, was not straightforward. In the South, it led to a doubling down on discrimination. The 19th Amendment had always been opposed in the South because of the fear it would, would destroy the tight control that party bosses had on, of the electorate. And naturally, those party bosses facing the prospect of increased numbers of potential black voters took new action to cut out the black vote, introducing such devices as white-only primaries and pursuing further intimidation. So this would only have put more pressure on African Americans. There was already injustice in the exclusion from, of black men from the vote. But when black women's newly won right was denied to, due to discriminatory action, this doubled the injustice they felt and would have experienced. This additional oppression would have added to the horrible weight of other discriminations like segregation and ultimately would lead to the African-American civil rights movement that reached its peak in the 1960s. This victory, like women's suffrage itself, took a long time, but also, as with women, smaller victories occurred on the way. In the 1920s, black women involved in Republican women's clubs and in the 1924 election were considered by the ticket to have contributed materially to the election of Calvin Coolidge. In Hot Springs in 1927, 3,000 black Americans helped to vote, in a, to vote in a new mayor who promised them a fair deal. And, quote, white men and women who carried Negroes to the polls, unquote, according to a newspaper report, worked with them for the result. Chicago elected the first northern black congressman to the House of Representatives in 1928. In the 1930s, Roosevelt brought together about 45 African Americans into what was called his black cabinet to work for a fair, fairer deal for all blacks. And also in the 1930s, though they weren't successful then, African Americans worked hard to ban poll taxes. Poll taxes were finally eradicated with a federal amendment in the 1960s. Now this, this, this list barely scratches the surface of the potential of the black vote after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. But successes like these would be part of the groundwork for the full-blown civil rights campaign of the 1960s. As the campaign against racial discrimination grew, it had the example of the women's suffrage campaign to draw on. The NWP's picketing had evolved into a battle over other fundamental rights, the freedom of assembly and freedom of speech. In their court battles about their imprisonment over trumped up charges, the NWP's strong constitutional arguments won the right to picket politically. The suffrage campaign therefore provided new tools to protest racial discrimination the picketing of the White House that suffragists had introduced for the first time ever in US history was available for use by other groups later on. And this was the protest against uh, a, a big case in Alabama, the Scottsboro Boys, in the 1930s. In the same place, there was also the vast range of publicity tools that the suffragists used available to African Americans, the African American Civil Rights Movement. There were marches, petitions, mass meetings in Washington DC to mention, that, to mention the main ones. This top slide on the left is the pilgrimage that the women took from New York to Washington DC in February and March of 1913 to join the big suffrage procession of March the 3rd. 
And down here, this is them arriving at the, um, right in Washington, D.C. And they, I can't, unfortunately, I can't point it out, but one of the small buildings on the left-hand side, beyond the white ones on the left, was the headquarters of Alice Paul and Lucy Burns at that time. So taking all these factors into consideration, in my view, the women's suffrage movement is an integral and key part of the evolution of all civil rights in the United States. In fact, it's pivotal because it tipped the balance irrevocably throughout the nation towards what Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton initially campaigned for just after the Civil War, and that was equal suffrage for all. Still other factors make the 19th Amendment monumental, and one is its spirit. The amendment states, the right of citizens to the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. This amendment is even-handed, and it applies to both sexes, and thereby it introduces to the Constitution for the first time terminology that cannot be interpreted to the exclusion of anyone in the way that the word man could be and was from the start of the Republic. This amendment raised the bar in the definition of equality, even though it could not directly affect equality under the law. Well, just over a month ago, I was in the Great Hall in the Clinton Library to be sworn in with 140 others as a US citizen. And that night, it really struck me and it totally surprised me, blew my mind. I had suddenly become a compatriot of three of my heroes, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, and Lucy Burns. I'd already been reflecting on their legacy. It's because of them that as a new female citizen, such as me, well, I'll be casting my first vote in two weeks' time. to think that I feel just now very much like the suffragists must have felt 92 years ago. I'm acutely aware of the vote's significance and power, and I have a sense of greater self-worth because I can take part in the process. This is what this cartoon was getting at, published in 1920. Without the vote, it says they're American half free, half female. They're taking the sign down and they're putting up the other one, the American, Demo American democracy, because it includes women, finally. Without the vote, without a say in government, women were unfree citizens of the nation. The vote made them individual, independent members of the polity. And that's why the sign in here is being changed. Women are are being brought into the, the, whole, the whole community of electors. The invisible shackles had been removed. The vote, along with, the other, with other benefits that women's suffrage brought, is an incredible legacy, I can tell you, for a new female US citizen to receive. And it's humbling to think that hundreds of women struggled long and hard for the cause, and many of them, including Susan B. Anthony, never lived to see the victory. So to me, the 19th Amendment left a legacy that should be forever honored. Yet the suffragists deserve honoring for even more than that. For the final factor that makes the 19th Amendment monumental is that the campaign for women's suffrage was the first successful, non-violent civil rights campaign ever in the United States. It was won without loss of life, and the only violence that was perpetrated was by the authorities in a desperate attempt to stop the women. So that's a contribution to national history, unfortunately, that's rarely recognized. And for all they did, for their peaceful achievement of their goal, the suffragists should receive what they don't get very often, and that's very visible recognition across the land. Thank you.
We do have time for just a couple questions. If you have one, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, ma'am. In your opinion, what do you think are the impediments or the major impediment to the ERA at this point in history? The total con she, she asked with the, the major impediment to the ERA. I think it's the total confusion over how amendments should be done. Um, there was a, in the Fifth Amendment, there was never any deadline put in. It was never specified there had to be a deadline. Deadlines were first introduced with the Prohibition Amendment in 1918. There was never a deadline for the 19th Amendment, but there have been deadlines ever since. There, was a, there were court cases about that, and the Supreme Court basically said, yes, you can have deadlines, but maybe you can't have deadlines. They're not clear on it. But the ERA got a deadline on it, then they had the deadline extended, then ratification wasn't completed before the extension of the deadline. It was after 10 years, lacking 30, sorry, lacking three states. And what happens is when women are campaigning at the minute for the Equal Rights Amendment, they go to their legislators and they say, well, the deadline's ended. We, so we can't do anything. You need to get rid of the deadline. They go to Congress. Can we get rid of the deadline? That's what they're doing now. There's a measure before Congress at the minute for that. And Congress doesn't want to do it because the deadline's pa been passed. So we're in a catch-22. And that's the biggest, um, the biggest impediment at the minute. And what we could do is just have one state to vote, and then you'd start rocking the boat about it. Because women aren't, aren't going to want to lose 36 ratifications. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here. This is fascinating. Um, one of the things I'm fascinated about is the, um, how suffrage tied hand in hand with temperance and prohibition. And I was wondering in your studies how that played in Arkansas, if those two debates merged at all, or if you took a look at that. Thank you. Suffrage and temperance were intertwined. And in fact, so, um, temperance started strongly in Arkansas before suffrage. The two of them, um, temperance people realized that suffrage could help them to get temperance, to get prohibition. So then they started supporting the temperance movement. I don't know about the actual discussions, but in Arkansas, the women were very, very closely interlinked. If you look at the list of people who are in the temperance movement, the leaders, and the list of people who are the leaders in suffrage, they're very, they're very much the same. And in particular, um, Clara McDermott built a house for the temperance movement, and that's where both the temperance movement and suffrage movement actually met at that time. I haven't followed it up later because basically suffrage became much, much stronger and that's my, that's my main interest. But the two of them were very closely align, aligned and very much so in, in Arkansas. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you so much for uh, coming and sharing all that with us this evening.